All right, let's see if you remember from last year. He is risen. He is risen. Oh, you remember. All right, if that was your first time, I'll give you another shot. Anytime you hear he is risen, you shout back. He is risen indeed. You ready? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Fantastic. Awesome. Yes, he is. I am so fired up. Today we are talking about the greatest comeback in history. I couldn't understand when I first heard why people were booing. They were just booing this guy. And I don't understand because he was doing great. We were in our high school football game, or basketball game. And we were in Burke, Virginia, at a school called Lake Braddock Secondary School. It was a 7th through 12th grade school. It was massive, almost 5,000 students. It was huge. And we were at this basketball game. Uh, I was with my, my two older brothers, and this guy just kept scoring. He was on fire. The other team couldn't stop him. I mean, like everything. He was raining down three-pointers. He was raining down two-pointers. He was dunking. The, it was incredible. And every time he scored, I kept hearing, boo, <laughs> boo. And I was like, Tim, why do our people hate this guy? What is, why, are they, why do they keep saying boo? And he says, Matt, they're not saying boo. They're saying Hugh, as in Hubert Davis. If you're not, if, if you're not familiar with Hubert Davis, this, this is a picture of him from my high school yearbook. Now, Hubert Davis, little did I know, would go on to become the University of North Carolina's head coach this past year, taking them to a record like, boom, NCAA championship. And depending on your point of view, you watched either the greatest comeback in history or the greatest collapse in history. But I didn't know that. So I looked at Tim and I said, why are they saying, he said, they're saying Hugh, it's his name. And then I looked and I realized that Tim was friends with him. I think we got a slide here. Waiting for it. There it is. Got a slide. Got one more. Yep. There it is on the right. And it says, this is great. Here's it's a great way to have fun because everyone gets into it, and we become this great, big, happy family, Mitchell said. Their enthusiasm gives us added incentive to perform, said athlete Hubert Davis. And then Mitchell's the president, vice president of SGA, my brother. And it was this incredible moment, and we didn't realize how great a moment in history we were looking at. He led us to many comebacks, and people love comeback stories, especially when they involve an underdog, like David beating Goliath, or like Rocky beating Drago. Because only in the movies could that little guy beat that massive giant Russian, right? I must break you. The great Ivan Drago. Or maybe you're like me and you grew up in your childhood and you watched this guy give comeback after comeback after the great Joe Montana, 31 fourth quarter comebacks. Or maybe you're a more recent fan of the GOAT and some of you think this guy might be the GOAT who had the world's shortest retirement and announced that he's back. And I feel very sorry for that guy who paid a half a million dollars for the football that he thought was the last touchdown Tom Brady threw, and now it's worth nothing. Everybody loves a comeback, especially when it's the old guys, right? People born in, in my decade, because it gives us hope. Like, like, we can still do it. Like, put me in, coach. I think my arm's still good. We, we still got this. We love to see the old guys hold back Father Time or push the sun back up in the sky for one last hurrah. It gives us hope. But don't go telling the old guys you did a great comeback. See, to them it's an insult. Because that implies that they failed, so that they disappeared. As the great theologian LL Cool J says, don't call it a comeback. I've been here for years. And that's kind of where we park it today. I was looking at this list of historic comebacks, and Sports Illustrated actually put out a list of the top 10 comebacks in history. And of course, they included the ones you'd expect, Muhammad Ali, <laughs> Kurt Warner with the Rams, the 93 Buffalo Bills. They even had John Travolta in there at number four. He said, in 1994, John Travolta defibrillates his comatose movie career by starring in Pulp Fiction. Michael Jordan, 1995, this is number three, quits baseball to make his first triumphant comeback. But what floored me was what Sports Illustrated said was the number one comeback of all time. You know what they said? Jesus. Wait, what? Jesus, literally, here's the quote. The resurrection proved his victory over death was the ultimate victory. Coming back to life is the greatest comeback of all time. Is that awesome or what? Sports Illustrated said that. The greatest comeback in the history of man, without a doubt, is the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus put it this way. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall never perish but have everlasting life. So let me ask just a very 
open-ended question, especially if you're a first-timer, maybe you're skeptical like I used to be. How does something that happened 2,000 years ago have any impact on me today? How does that have any bearing? What is that? I mean, I get it. I hear it. I believe. I, I sort of know the, the story. I heard it when I was a kid. Here's the answer. Because Jesus came back, you can too. Because Jesus lives and rose, you can rise again too. That was the whole point. So we're going to look at four great comebacks today. We're going to look at each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each one highlights something different that you can come back from. In Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, we see this. I can come back from despair. This is good news. If you're hurting, you've been struggling. Man, this last year or two has just punched you in the gut, and then another dude comes up in the dark and gives you a throat punch, and that's how you feel about this whole season. If you have despair, this is the gospel for you. So many people are struggling with hopelessness, with despair, with discouragement, even depression. And they're asking, how do you bounce back from a worldwide pandemic? How do you bounce back from a shutdown? How do you bounce back when my entire income is destroyed? How do you bounce back from losing a house? How do you bounce back from losing your kids or a loved one? How do you bounce back from that horrible surprise doctor's diagnosis that you didn't see coming? How do you bounce back from despair? As you look at scripture, the Gospel of Matthew paints this beautiful, vivid picture of two people that were wallowing in despair. Just set the context of what you're about to hear. Jesus has just died. He's just been taken down. His lifeless body just been taken down off the cross, put in a borrowed tomb, this massive 1,500-pound stone rolled in front of it, and he's dead. There's no doubt he's dead. The pierce with a spear in the side loss of blood. We went through this Wednesday night, the horrible, horrible things he went through, the torture. And he's laying there in the tomb, and we see Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting around in the graveyard, and they're staring at the grave. Y'all, that is discouragement. The next morning comes, and they say, hey, let's go back and look at the grave some more today. Whee! And they do. There's no pep in their step. They trudge to what you and I would think of as a modern-day graveyard. And they sit down, and they stare at the tomb. But this morning, something is different. Something drastic has changed. That's where we pick up the story. Check it out with me. Continue reading Matthew 28. At dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. I love, I love that defiant and triumphant posture. Just sits on the stone. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus. He was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. And there it is. Right there we hear those three words that replace despair with hope. The angel says he has risen. Those three words are the reason a billion people got up this morning and have gathered, just like us, to worship a risen Savior. This is what separates us from every other false faith in the world. This right here. No other religious leader can claim to have risen from the dead like this. You go to their tomb today, it doesn't matter if it's Buddha, if it's Krishna, if it's Joseph Smith, if it's Muhammad, if it's L. Ron Hubbard, if it's Tom Cruise. If you go to, the, to their tombs, well not Tom, he's still alive, right? But you will see their bodies. Only Jesus can say he was risen. He was not there. The body was missing. Because he has risen, it is possible that we can say he is risen indeed. Think about that. What is it about those three words that is stirring our hearts this morning? Notice how no one has gathered for 2,000 years to say, the stock market has risen. <laughs> the stock market has risen indeed. You didn't say that back to me, right? Nobody goes up and says, your age has risen. <laughs> your age has, your weight has risen. <laughs> your weight has risen indeed, right? You're going to get slapped for that. That's, hey Amen. I heard that. We don't say those words, but we do say he is risen and we respond. He is risen indeed because that changed everything. That is finally, there's one verifiable proof that there is something lasting besides death and taxes. There is something beyond the grave that I can count on. Don't miss this. There is hope. Hope is huge. Hope is powerful. If you've ever been 
visiting a marriage counselor, right? Let's take this couple here. They're not happy. They're coming. They're having a typical fight. It's a spat. Any, you ask any pastor, any marriage counselor, they know that when a couple comes to them, no matter how damaged the marriage may seem, I'm talking even if it's 98% damaged, the counselor has only one goal, just one. And that is if he can get that couple to have just a, a 2% improvement, he knows they'll make it. Just 2%, even if it's tiny. Why? Because when somebody gets even just the tiniest bit of improvement, they get hope. And they have joy. And they know that there is a chance. And they go from looking like this to looking like this. And they're happy. They have hope. Of course she's happy, right? She's got the remote. I mean, that's, you know, some of you caught that right away. The truth is, when somebody gets hope, we know that anything is possible. And the resurrection of Jesus fuels our hope. When you get hope, anything is possible for your marriage. Anything is possible for your kids, for your future. If you have hope, anything can happen. But without it, you have despair. And it feels like nothing is possible. Think about these two women we just read about. They show up, and they are hopeless. They are filled with despair. But guess what happened? The news spread. Christ was risen. They walked away filled with hope. And right then, anything became possible for these women. And they went and told the men who were huddled in a, a locked room, scared for their life. And it spread beyond the region. And you and I are celebrating it 2,000 years later because we can come back from despair. The Gospel of Mark highlights something else. Mark says, I can come back from defeat. And I'm so glad we can say this. In the book of Mark, we learn that because of the resurrection, defeat wasn't the end. Death did not have the final say. Every one of us have blown it. Every one of us have failed. Some of us have failed hard, fell far, and we've wallowed in that defeat. We've all been like, uh, like little Johnny here in one of my favorite all-time stories. There's a story that says, in class, Mr. Johnson calls on Johnny, and he calls him over to his desk after they've taken this test, and he says, Johnny... I'm going to be honest with you. I have a feeling that you have been cheating. Johnny's incredulous. What? Not me. And he said, no, no, I, I, want to, I want to go over this. I was looking at your test, and the question came up, who was our first U.S. president? And Mary, the little girl who was sitting right beside you, put George Washington. And so did you. Well, well yeah, but everybody knows that. I mean, that, 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 that's common knowledge. You know, wait just a minute, Mr. Johnson. The next question was, who wrote the Gettysburg Address? And Mary wrote Abraham Lincoln, and so did you. Yeah, I don't understand what the problem is. Everybody knows that that's history. We, we understand. So wait, I'm not done. The next question was, who was president during the Louisiana Purchase? And Mary put, I don't know, and you wrote, me neither. So, <laughs> I wonder if the Apostle Peter can identify with Johnny in that story who fell, who was caught red-handed. He fell hard. Remember, Peter is the one who was flexing his muscles, literally quoted talking to Jesus saying, even if all these other disciples fall, I never will. I am with you to the end, Jesus. I am the one who you can count on. No matter what else happens, I am your man to the end. There's just one problem. It wasn't true. Peter wasn't there for him when Jesus needed him most. And Peter fell hard. Y'all remember the story? After making the strong thing, I will be with you to the end, the rooster crows three times, and he's not there. Not only is he not there, he denies Jesus. Not once, not twice, but a third time, a little girl even accuses him. Hey, I think you're one of them. Aren't you with that Jesus? I don't even know what you're talking about. Says he even calls down curses and swears. He's so vehemently denying Jesus. The rooster crows, and it says Peter went out, and he wept bitterly for his sin. You know, i got to ask. When is the last time you wept bitterly over your sin? See, Peter fell. He fell hard. Do you have despair? Do you have that kind of defeat? It's okay, because guess what happened? Shortly after that, when they're cowering in the shadows and they, they, they run away, Jesus reappears, and an angel shares the good news. Hey, Jesus is alive. Go tell the disciples and Peter he has a future. Go tell him. Go, you go tell them that Jesus still loves him. You make sure Peter knows he has a future, he still matters, and he can come back from defeat. 
So if that's you, take heart today. If you've blown it, and we all have, it's okay. You're in the right place on the right day. Because the whole gospel of Mark is saying this. Christ's resurrection means no matter what your past is, it doesn't matter. It is not unforgivable. And maybe you just needed to hear that today. It is not unforgivable. There, you cannot walk so far away from God that he still can't reach you. And that is great news. We're celebrating. There's this great old story about the Polish concert pianist named Paderewski. If you haven't heard this, Paderewski was this huge legendary pianist, and he sold out this arena everywhere he went. And one time, before the, the concert started, before the curtain would go up and everything, this one lady looks, and she brought her young son, and he has disappeared. And the boy makes his way up onto the stage, all the way to Paderewski's great concert piano, opens the curtain, and sits down at his piano. And all eyes are on this boy. And he sits down at the piano. Is this on? All right. He sits down, and in front of a packed house, starts playing. Oh, I remember it. Chopsticks. The story says Paderewski hears this, begins his concert early, comes up behind the boy, and begins playing the most incredible counter melody. And he whispers into the boy's ear, keep going. You're doing great. Don't stop. Don't stop. Listen to the crowd cheering for you. Keep going. You're doing great. And that's what God said to Peter. That's what Jesus, through the angel, said, don't give up. I know you failed. Come back. I have a future for you. God is saying that to us today. Just like Peter, when we repent, when we come back to him, he wraps his arms around us and restores us. And maybe you just needed to hear that today. We can discover, we can experience God this morning when we want his forgiveness, when we repent, he is there to bring us back. Keep going. You can come back from defeat. The Gospel of Luke reveals this. I can come back from doubt. And this one hits closest to home. Growing up in a NASA household where science reigned supreme, where that was our God, just follow the science, right? Even though it changes every week with man's ever-changing opinion, this was our idol. So when I read scriptures, I had so many doubts. I wanted proof. I wanted to look, and I wanted to be able to hold it. I wanted to test it. I wanted to verify it. I wanted to reproduce it, and I wanted to certify the results, all the immutable rules of science. And as I look at this, I'm so grateful that Luke was a doctor. The only one we realized that was a, a physician, a learned man, an educated man, who was a skeptic. What people don't realize is Luke was written to the Greeks, and the Greeks were the smart ones. They were educated. They were the philosophers of the time, the thinkers, and they were skeptical beyond belief. So Luke shows up and he says, hey guys, why are you looking for the living in a graveyard? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He ris he's risen just like he said. See, just like these Greeks, some of us are wired to be skeptical. That's okay. God can handle your questions. It is not wrong to have doubts and have questions. You know what's wrong? To keep them. To not do your own research, your own homework, and get to the bottom of it. That's wrong. That's hiding. Find out why you're doubting. God can handle it. He's so much bigger than our pseudo-intellect that we fancy. He can handle your doubts. Bring them to him. Luke says this to the skeptics and the doubters. He says, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to them, and he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Not just a couple, not just a few, many convincing proofs. What I love here is the Greek that he uses is a word called tekmerioi. And it literally translates to legally admissible evidence. It is this beautiful thing. He is saying the evidence for Jesus is so strong it will hold up in court. Right? Don't miss this. So even the Bible is saying, guys, you don't have to take this on blind faith. Touch him. Test him. Feel this out. You don't have to believe anything without solid evidence, without many convincing proofs. Dr. Luke has them. Here's what Luke would record about Jesus. Keep reading. Luke 24, 36, he says, while they were still talking about this, the disciples, Jesus himself showed up, stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. 
they were startled and frightened thinking they saw a ghost. You know why? Because he had been dead, and now he's back. The disciples are in a huddled, cloistered room, curtains drawn, door locked and barred, and they're fearing for their lives. And Jesus somehow manages to walk through the walls and show up. And he says, peace be with you. You would freak out too. It was horrifying. They thought they had seen a ghost. Keep reading. And he says, guys, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Okay, look at my hands. Look at my feet. It's me, myself. Touch me. See, a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, all right, I'll tell you what. Do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it. Y'all, let's just make a deal with each other that if we ever come back from the dead and we're there, to, with, we're not going to give each other broiled fish. Can we give each other like Krispy Kremes or something better than that? Jesus takes the fish and he eats it right there in front of them, in their presence, to prove he was real. He had a body. And he said to them, this is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Everything. Did you see it? This must be fulfilled. Look at that last sentence. Everything that was written in the law of Moses, the first five books, plus the Psalms, plus the prophets. So what he's saying is when you study this, the evidence for the resurrection was so compelling, it's actually hard not to believe it. The Old Testament was stopped being written. That canon was closed 450 years before Jesus was born, before the New Testament even started, okay? So there's 400 plus years of what we call silence between the ending of the Old Testament being written and the New Testament life, okay? You with me so far? So during this 450 years, we have this passage of time, and what is so stunning here is the Old Testament includes Psalms and it includes Isaiah. So Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 have something very bizarre written in them. There's two passages that describe in detail the crucifixion of the Son of God. There's just one problem with that. The crucifixion hadn't been invented yet. Yet this prophet is writing about it 450 years at a minimum before it even shows up. This would be so incredible. It would be as if you and I today, here in 2022, are writing about a new form of capital punishment that wouldn't be invented until the year 2450. Think about that. All right, let me put it in modern day terms. In a couple months, there's a new movie coming out, Thor. I think we have a slide for this, where Love and Thunder, he shows back up, and this is a continuation. It doesn't look like it's going to be very good. But the previous one was Thor Ragnarok. And if you saw that, there was this great character here who was the Grandmaster. And Jeff Goldblum had this, anybody know what this stick's called? The melt stick. It was a form of capital punishment. What he did is when somebody was sentenced to death, he, all he would do was just lightly touch them and they would poof, disappear in a puff of blue smoke. It was a capital offense. It would be like our equivalent of an electric chair. And it was called the melt stick. So this would be as bizarre as if you sat down today and said, in the year 2450, I see a man named Goldblum of Jeffestein who will have a stick of melting and he will use it as a capital. Do you see how ridiculous and how crazy that would be if you had that kind of foresight? That's what is happening here. The Old Testament, so long before crucifixion even invented, shows up or does it? And this is where the doubters, including me, had a problem. They started looking at this and they said, this has to have been added after Jesus died. This proves the scriptures are fake. There's no way this could happen. Our oldest manuscripts are in question until 1947, when a young Bedouin shepherd was in Qumran, and he was doing what shepherds do in their idle time. He was throwing rocks, trying to hit cave openings way up in the hills. And one rock that he threw didn't have the sound he expected. In fact, when it went in a cave, something shattered. And he said, something's in there. And he got his buddies, and they climbed way up these dangerous cliffs, and they went inside, and they found what we know today as the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
and they opened it up. There were so many things in this cave. In fact, it would take a decade for them to discover all that was in this one cave. It became the single greatest archaeological discovery of our lifetime. Incredible. So guess what happened? The atheists, the skeptics, the doubters, people like me, and Jewish historians came together. All the scientists came, and they began to unroll these scrolls. And they had been hidden for, it looks as if centuries before Jesus was born, written hundreds of years, and stashed away for the future generations for us. And as they unrolled these scrolls, the non-believers, believers alike, with heart-stopping intensity, they rolled the scroll to Isaiah 53, which our modern Bibles talk about a crucifixion that hadn't existed. And when they got there, they knew this was either going to describe the crucifixion or it would finally be the death nail. It would be proof that everything was false because it was added later. They unrolled the great scroll of Isaiah, one of the best intact scrolls we've ever found. And guess what they saw? There it was. Word for word, in full detail, the description of the crucifixion right there, word for word, just as your modern Bible has it. Well, that's why it makes your hair stand up when you go today and you can visit and look at the original scrolls still on display. And you can go up and you can say, this is it. This is proof. Every time science discovers something, it only validates the word of God. So you can come back from your doubt. You can have a solid faith. Lastly, in the Gospel of John, we see that we can come back from death. And this is the big one. This is what it's all leading to. Because of the resurrection, I can come back from death itself. Even bad people don't want to die. Even the meanies, even the bullies are scared of death. There's this great scene. There's, see, we've got the Bible here. This is our, our source of scripture, our source of truth. Our source. But right underneath that is a series, a franchise of movies called Star Wars. It's, just, it's, right, it's not that close, but there's this great scene where Anakin Skywalker is fearing that he is about to lose the love of his life, Padme, his wife, that he married in secret. Jedis aren't supposed to have love and attachment like that. And he's having these dreams, these horrifying visions that his wife is going to die. And he's terrified. And he goes to who he thinks is a friendly mentor, but he's not. He's actually the evil soon Emperor Palpatine. And he sits there, and Anakin's telling him these things, and he senses that you are troubled, my child. What is on your mind? And they have this horrifying conversation where the bad guy looks at Anakin and says, tell me something. Have you ever heard of the legend of Darth Plagueis? No, I haven't, he says. This man was whispered to have found the knowledge to cheat even death itself. Anakin is hooked. His eyes grow wide. He looks at him. And he thinks, I want that. I got to have that knowledge. He says, is it possible to learn that knowledge? And he looks at Anakin with this sinister smirk, and he says, not from a Jedi, implying I can teach you as a Sith, an evil Sith Lord. I have the knowledge. Why did they care? Because they were afraid. They were terrified. Even the bad guys were scared of death. And Jesus shows up, and he says, guys, I beat death. I have taken the sting out of it. He says this in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die, so do you believe this? In other words, Jesus is saying, if you are connected with him, because he rose, you can rise. Because he lives, you can live forever, if you are connected to him. So that's my question today. Before we have the Easter egg hunt, before all the kids come in, before everything gets crazy and our minds go elsewhere, let me ask you this question. Are you connected to the giver of eternal life? I want you to contemplate that. In fact, we're going to end a little differently. I'm going to go ahead and have our band come back up. And I want, to, I want to ask you a question. If you've never thought about death, our culture doesn't really like to talk about it much. So the next party you go to, I want you to raise your Diet Coke and say, hey, guys, let's raise a glass and let's talk about death for a minute. And I want you to see how quickly you become the buzzkill of that party. The music could be bump, mm, 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 going in. You say, hey, how's it going? You want to talk about death? <laughs> Record scratch. Because we're scared. Because we don't want to talk about it. 
How foolish is it that we know what's coming, yet we do not address it? Can you imagine? Do you know what every one of us has in common? 150 years from now, not a single one of us will be sitting here. Not one. We know that that train is headed towards that cliff. We know it. No one escapes it, not even Anakin. Yet how foolish are we if we never think about it just because we're scared to talk about it? This is the good news. Because there is a risen Savior, you don't have to fear death. You can be secure. John's gospel was written to everyone. He focuses on the divinity of Jesus, and I love that. He really is who he says he is. And he says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, signs that were not recorded in this book. But these, right, these few are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of the living God. And by believing, you may have life in his name. Did you catch that? Do you grasp that? Or have you, you, you think you know how this story ends and you've just kind of glossed over it? I did that. I did that for years. Jesus was showing all of us by believing in him, by repenting of sins, we can have life even after death. Have you lost a family member to death? It'll have your attention. I think about all the great legends of the faith that have gone on before us. Charles Spurgeon, Billy Graham, Ruth Graham, and their mentor, D.L. Moody, the greatest evangelist of the 1800s. So many things are in place today because of this legendary godly man. And as he lay on his deathbed, his whole family came and gathered around him, his huge family. And he said that on his deathbed, he closed his eyes and he said, I can see their faces. I can see their faces. And one of his sons who was still alive beside him says, Father, I think you might be dreaming. And it said he opened his eyes and he looked at his son. And he says, no, sir, I am not dreaming. I have been given a glimpse inside the gates and I see my two sons who have gone on before me. And I see family. And I see people lining up. They are my welcoming party. Today is my coronation day. And it is glorious. And with that, he closed his eyes and he exhaled his last breath. What gives a man that confidence? It's knowing that death is not the end for those who know Jesus. Two weeks ago, when I saw my mom lying in her bed, gasping for her final breaths, Next to her was a notebook, and there she had drawn a picture of Jesus with his hand reaching out for her. And then I remember a conversation just days before where she said, Matt, I'm ready to go take my Savior's hand. She smiled. What is it that gives somebody that confidence to where we don't fear death? We don't mourn as those who have no hope. We mourn as those who do have hope because we know the Savior. Jesus' resurrection is what gives us that. He came back, and we can come back. Because of that, we know anything is possible. I don't have to live with doubt or despair. I don't have to live with defeat. I don't have to fear death. I know my future is secure because of the resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection of the life. So no matter how you walked in this morning, no matter what your background is, you can experience the resurrection life of Jesus today. If you are here today and you are honestly a seeker after God, I want to invite you to reach out to him right where you are. In fact, just close your eyes. Just bow with me. Tune out the distractions. And just in your own way, just word what your heart is thinking. Just, just pour it out to the Lord. God, I thank you for inviting me to experience your resurrection. Tell him, God, I confess my sin to you. Just like everyone else in this room, I need your forgiveness. Lord, I repent. I turn my back on my sin, and I reach toward you. Just like these great heroes of old, Lord, we, we take your hand, the only one who has overcome death. You've taken the sting and the fear out of death. I accept your sacrifice on that cross as payment for my sin. And I turn my life over to your control. Holy Spirit, will you invade my world now? Take the ownership rights. 
Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Steer me. Take charge from this moment forward as I surrender my life to you. Thank you for saving me from my sins. Thank you for making a way where there was no way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.